Boa tarde, boa tarde a todos que estão nos ouvindo. Meu nome é Cláudio Pinhanes, eu sou vice-diretor do C4AI. Uh, esta palestra vai ser em inglês, então eu vou agora trocar para o, o inglês. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, everyone. There, this is the Perspectives in AI Seminar of the Center for Artificial Intelligence for AI. The center is a, 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 a joint lab uh, which is part of, of a partnership of IBM and University of Sao Paulo and FAPESPIR. We are committed to, to high-level research in Brazil and exploring fundamental issues of AI applications and also social impacts. Please uh, visit us in our page, in our web page, and follow us in LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, the links will be posted in the, in the chat for that. Uh, <clears throat> this seminar focuses on bringing outstanding AI researchers to present their work and discuss the state of art in AI. And today we have a very, uh, uh, a very distinguished professor from the University of Southern California, uh, Professor uh, Maya Matarik. Hello. Hello, How are you? everyone. So, well, welcome. I wish I wish I could be there. Well, I think we also wish to be in LA, but giving other things. <laughs> right? Anyway, but it's a pleasure to have you here. We have a, 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 a large audience already. It's, we have a lot of interest in, in, in your talk. Uh, I'll just give a very quick introduction and I will leave the floor uh, to you. So Maya Matarik is the Chan Su Xiong um, Distinguished Professor in the Computer Science Department uh, in the Neuroscience Program and the Department of Pediatrics and Interim. In a, she's of the University of Southern California. She's also the Interim Vice President for Research at the same university. She has a long and distinguished career in, in AI, starting in the 90s, uh, when in, at MIT, studying with uh, Rod Brooks, among others. Um, and, this, and then she went to USC. She founded uh, the USC Robotics and Autonomous Systems Center. She's the co-director of the research lab in robotics. And also she has a, a very interesting work on K-12 education and, uh, and, uh, and, and she's the lead of the, what's called the Viterbi K-12 STEM Center of USC. And I hope she can talk to us a little about that work also during her talk. So anyway, it's an honor to, to have you here. I would like also to welcome our, all of our uh, of people watching this talk. Please post uh, questions in the chat, in the YouTube channel. We'll collect them uh, and, 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 give, and, and put them to, to Maya at the end. And uh, having said that, Thank you for setting and, and and let's start to talk. All right. Well, thank you again for hosting me. Um, and I really look forward to the questions at the end. So please be ready, save them up. I love q and It's my favorite part of the talk. I don't like hearing myself talk. So I want to hear you. Um, so I'm a roboticist. I've been a roboticist for a long time. Um, and, you know, when we think about what the point of robotics is, well, the field was created a long time ago, really, um, to do originally what we called the three Ds of robotics, the dirty, dull, and dangerous tasks. But if we look at what robotics is doing today in this explosion of technological advances, we see that we're creating machines um, that can do anything that we imagine. So we're no longer driven or even constrained by things being dirty, dull, and dangerous. And I guess what I would like to say is that maybe that isn't completely good. And so I'm going to lead with a particular uh, warning, which is that we need to be a little bit more balanced or maybe a lot more balanced in terms of how we weight automation and augmentation. Because um, automation, the current focus of robotics, is about substituting human work with machines. 
um, because of reaching you know lower costs and higher efficiencies. But there's really a major role for robotics in augmentation, which is enhancing human ability, not replacing it. And so what I want to talk about today is how robots can have a key role in helping people and in society without actually doing our physical work, which is a very interesting and to some people a surprising notion. So what I want to tell you about is this field of socially assistive robotics, which is now almost 20 years old. Um, and the field is quite developed and its focus is to use robots to help people help themselves. So without using physical work, but really through social interaction. And so we're going to talk about how there are many technologies out there today that can help us monitor what people are doing, right? You, you, can, have, you can have wearable sensors, you can have your, your smart watch, you can have your phone, all of these things are collecting data about you. But unfortunately, just collecting data does not change behavior. The next thing we have is we have various coaching and training apps and other technologies that are you know, sort of telling us what to do. They're taking data about us and then they're using those data to tell us what to do. Um, but that also turns out to not be highly effective at changing human behavior. And so what is most necessary is to have some support for human motivation to drive what drives us. So to get me to do something, I have to want to do that thing. So what makes me want to do something? Well, it turns out the most powerful um, driver of behavior uh, comes from social interaction. So what we're going to focus on in, in this talk and in, in this field broadly is how we use social, and social factors and companionship in order to support people in human machine interaction in order to help people help themselves. And this is a really interesting combination of fields and technologies and disciplines, right? Because clearly this isn't just robotics. Yes, there's robotics, but there's also social science. There's cognitive science. Obviously there's ethics. There's so many interesting components and it really is, a, is an exploding area in terms of both applications and challenges. So hopefully you'll enjoy the ride. And of course, the reason behind this field, how did it come about? Well, it came about from need. Um, societal needs. So if we look at the human health challenges, most of these numbers are from the US, but you know they're, they're common um, to most of the developed countries and they're in many ways worse elsewhere. Um, so we, we see huge opportunities based on this huge need to support whether it's youth, whether it's the elderly, whether it's um, challenges across the age span, these numbers just keep getting worse. I've been using this slide for more than a decade and I just keep having to improve increase the numbers, which is the wrong direction. I'd like the numbers to go down. We all would. And then if we talk about major societal challenges, of course, we're in one right now. Um, and it's one that we weren't prepared for. And so, you know, on the one hand, we have amazing technological support, such as remote education, remote training, remote therapy. But on the other hand, we also have um, isolation, loneliness, depression, um, all of the side effects in some ways of both the situation that we find ourselves in um, and also the technologies that we're putting forward in order to deal with it. And so it's a very interesting time, a time of challenge, a time of opportunity. And I want to get us to think about what's been done in this field of socially assistive robotics for the last 17 years um, and to see how that can inform you know, the next 17 or, or 50. Um, and so I want to tell you in particular the work that we have done um, that has taken these systems out of the lab and into the wild. Because the main point I'm going to make is that what matters is what we do out in the wild, not what we do um, in the lab. So the lab should be a very small first step and everything should be mostly outside. So um, we have a lot of uh, sh stories to tell from studies that have been done in both short-term, mid-term and long-term deployments. And I'm going to tell you about work that's been done, you know, in like cl clinics and uh, nursing homes and schools and eventually in people's homes over a period of weeks and even months. And so that's the, the these insights have been um, collecting over. So you'll be uh, bringing her back as soon as she's back here. Uh, in the meantime, I, I see there's a lot of activity in the chat. People from uh, from Itajuba, Franca, 
São Bernardo do Campo, Ribeirão Preto, Butantã, é, Reinaldo's from Butantã, great, great to see you. And, uh, and again, sorry for the, the, the delay in the beginning and for this technical glitch now. So I great. don't know, I don't know what caused this. It's never happened before. I'm afraid that it's your platform. So I'm really worried if it happens again, but we'll do our best. Okay, um, so why don't you, I think you have to share your slides again. Oh, I thought I and, had. I and did. I promise we'll cut this out in the in the final editing of the YouTube video. You don't yeah. when okay. people can watch you, it. Uh, yeah, can, can you see the slides? I you can see the slides. I think I can leave the stage. Okay. Yes. And we can get back to talk. Thank you. All right. Ready? Okay, so um, as we saw on the last slide, um, we have 17 years of experience of doing this kind of work in the wild. Um, and it's really all about empowering behavior change. So we're trying to help people help themselves. So providing technology that supports this kind of self-help. And the challenges are how do you generate and sustain motivation for doing behaviors that are difficult, not necessarily physically, but cognitively and emotionally and socially. How do people keep doing the behaviors, which is sustaining adherence? And then how do we develop grit, which is continuing to do it through failure? And what I'm going to talk about is um, how we model behavioral phenomena, such as grit, such as motivation, such as engagement, such as personality. How do we model individual users relative to these phenomena? Because that's important. The individual models are more important than general models, as we'll find out. And that personalization to each user is critical because in these kinds of domains, um, general models don't really work. You Really what you need is individualized models that adapt over time. Um, one of the questions we can ask is why robots? Um, and the main answer is that if we look at the neuroscience of embodiment, we see that embodiment drives motivation, retention, and enjoyment of activity, which is critical for this kind of behavior change. So it's not that you cannot do behavior change through other kinds of um, methods and technologies it's just that embodiment is a very powerful way to do it and that's why this field is surrounded um, and is focused on human robot interaction where the robot is in the physical world uh, but of course being in the physical world uh, creates all kinds of complexities so everything about the robot's body is important and complex right what it looks like how big is it does it appear male or female you may not care whether it's male or female but every human on the planet sees gender on a robot um, that's just how we're wired. And so is it the gender that you intended? Did you, does it distract from what it's supposed to do? These kinds of things are important. Um, everything, uh, proxemics, use of space, I'll give you an example. Uh, Dykes' pointing, we find that how people interpret robot pointing is actually kind of different from the way we interpret human pointing, which is important because when you point to something, you're conveying sometimes really important task information, body language, uh, emotion expression, all of these are open areas of research and really exciting work is being done. Let me give you an example of uh, one very fundamental, apparently basic and yet hard problem, which is how does a robot know where to stand and move relative to a human, how loudly to speak and how much to move its arms around? Um, and here's a dissertation, an entire dissertation by Ross Mead on, on that topic. And I wouldn't say it's a solved problem, but he made uh, major strides. Let's hear it from him directly. In this work, we consider how the robot recognizes both speech and gestures in a face-to-face -face social interaction. The robot first imagines itself at thousands of different locations in a room. At each location, it predicts how loudly the person will speak and in what region of space the person will gesture. The robot then predicts how well it will automatically recognize speech and gestures and assigns a score to the location based on this prediction. Finally, the robot selects the location at which it predicts it will perform the best and moves to that location. Here, we see the robot predicts it will work well between one and a half and two and a half meters. The robot selects 1.7 meters as the optimal location to recognize human. Oh no, what? What's happening now? All right, what happened? I in speech and gestures and moves there. All right, so that's how he does it in real time. 
Uh, but let's look at it over time. So really what matters is dynamic. So when done correctly, her C-mix is like dancing. And when done incorrectly or maliciously, it could be bullying. Please don't kick people. It will physically hurt them. Stop it. Pointing and laughing at people is not appropriate. You should not do this because it is demeaning. Stop. You look like you are about to punch me. So here's an example of a complex problem of interaction where we are interested in detecting bullying behaviors. Now this is really a, a human activity recognition and machine learning as well as a robotics problem. So how can we know when someone is acting inappropriately in order to have the robot detect it and then attempt, attempt to help people um, not do that so much, especially with children, if we're trying to teach children not to act like bullies so that they wouldn't become adult bullies, something that is worth doing. Um, so how would you do that? How would you get bullying data? Well, you can have fake bullying data, but the problem with doing training of machine learning models on fake data or active data um, is that then those models are not very predictive of actually real behavior in the real world. Um, so we were interested in collecting real behavior in the real world, difficult to do with bullying. And so one example was creating this sensitive robot, um, which then elicits bullying. Um, and so we had it around kids as a demo and it made them immediately motivated to uh, sort of bully the robot jokingly. And so we collected a bunch of data and you know did classification and you know there's interesting published machine learning on that. But I think the main point I want to talk about here is really how do you get the data to do realistic real-time interaction? And that's a big problem in machine learning. So machine, machine learning is very powerful at kind of narrow focus problems. And yes, you can detect faces in images and you can detect a particular face and a lot in perception has been done but very little has still been done for problems where we're in the real world with different kinds of users and different kinds of environments with movement, et cetera. Those are still very wide open, interesting problems. Um, sometimes the robots we're using are not terribly expressive. Um, so they may not have arms or, or they may not have expressive capabilities. And so we're interested in, in leaping into another area which is mixed reality and helping people and robots have a shared world through mixed reality, such as augmented reality. And so for example, we're looking at um, using a, a robot that's not very expressive, like the Mayfield Curie that looks like a little snowman, um, and then using augmented reality so that the user sees additional features and capabilities and affordances on the robot that are not physically there, but they are there in their shared world. And this can be a very powerful way to actually teach people. In this case, we were teaching um, students to learn math. Uh, by having this shared world between the robot and the student. And it's important that the physical robot is there, otherwise you don't get that social engagement. But at the same time, um, if they're just physically there, the robot won't in the real world have the ability to you know, reach for objects and do all these things safely. Um, and so there's an interesting mixture of technologies here. Um, in another domain, we're interested in uh, helping young children who might have movement disorders early in life, helping to diagnose those and then um, have them actually receive personalized interaction from a robot to get them to uh, exercise their limbs. Now, this may seem like a, you know, why are we doing this? Why aren't we getting people to, to help their own babies? Well, people should absolutely help their own babies, but it's very hard with a, with a young adult, uh, with a young baby to get them to observe an adult and imitate an adult because of the size difference. So those mirror neurons that are firing to imitate are still developing. And so there's this kind of interesting, interesting process happening where if you put a, a robot that is baby sized across from a baby, the robot may motivate the baby to move more effectively um, than an adult might. I mean, really another baby would do a great job, but we don't know how to make babies coach other babies to do things. So instead we use a robot. So here's an example of what that looks like. Get it's, uh, the robot is showing the baby what what the baby should be doing. Eventually, phase. the baby learns after about two minutes. That's pretty darn good. Uh, most robots can't figure these things out that quickly, but the babies are smart. Um, 
So we want them. And so what we can do, as you will see, is we can predict now where the baby will look. Ah, oh, yeah, it's just fun, fun experiment for babies. And if we remove the robot, then the babies are very sad. But what's interesting here is that uh, by using computational models of surprise, we can predict where the baby will look. We can have, therefore, the robot move in a particular way to drive the infant's attention and therefore drive their behavior. Because for very young infants, you know, where they look, that drives what they do. Um, and so if we can drive their attention, we can drive their behavior. We want to drive their behavior to get them to exercise their limbs. So there's this really interesting loop that actually has a computational grounding as well. Um, so that was a little bit about embodiment. Now let's talk about interaction. So the robot has a body. It relates to the user in some way, non-physical. Now, how do we do all the subtleties of interaction? The timing, the turn-taking, the, the theory of mind, recognizing intent, emotion expression, social roles. Uh, no shortage of exciting topics again. So historically in our lab, we've looked at things like... Um, how can we personalize the feedback that the robot gives to the user, uh, which is basically what it says and what it does, in order to motivate the user to do what they need to be doing and to maybe discourage them from doing what they don't want to be doing or they shouldn't be doing. Um, and so for one, one piece of work that we did quite a while ago was to actually do a quantifiable model of uh, extroversion, introversion personality. And we found strong results that if you match the personality, the expressed personality of the robot with the user, the users exercise more and are happier about it. Um, and so it's very interesting to see how we could do that, both from a machine learning perspective and from simply the perspective of what does it even mean for a robot to have a personality? Um, and personality is expressed in the behaviors that we do. So how close does the, ro does the robot get? How much does it gesticulate? What does it say? How fast does it speak? These were all measurable, quantifiable dimensions that, that we could apply machine learning to. So there's some kind of really interesting lessons there, which have now been replicated in HCI as well, about matching the personality of the agent to the user in order to improve the user's motivation and performance. Um, sometimes um, the problem is not one-on-one, -on -one, it's uh, one-to-many. So we're also interested in robots helping groups of people, not just individuals. Um, and uh, for example, this is work of Elaine Short uh, from a couple of years ago where she uh, looked at the problem of how a robot can help a group of people work together and solve problems. And she's cast that as a computational model of assigning resources, really. It's a resource allocation problem, where the resource is who gets to talk, who gets the object that, that needs to be passed around, et cetera. And you can think about how to optimize that. If you optimize for fastest solution, then what happens is you get an imbalance in the group. Some people talk, others never talk. Some are never part of the solution. And this mirrors organizational theor theory in uh, human organizations. If on the other hand, the robot pays attention to who all has spoken, who hasn't, encourages there to a balance among everyone you know, speaking and contributing, uh, what you end up with is a much higher level of group cohesion. And then even after two weeks, when we bring the people back, they're more willing to work together. And even in competitive games, they're less cutthroat. Um, so th there's some really interesting results to show that having a robot in a group can actually improve cohesion of the human group and make people be less selfish to one another. So the kind of the robot ends up being the most humane one in the group, which is exciting. Uh, we're extending that work now to look at robot mediated support groups um, for people like cancer survivors. Uh, this became particularly interesting during the pandemic where people were even more uh, separated and alone and having to deal with you know, multiple layers of challenges. So, so this is a new area that we're going into where we're looking at the robot supporting groups um, who need to really trust one another and disclose sensitive information. Um, and it's complex because the humans doing this role also experience burnout because it's so emotionally heavy. So there's a real role where the robot can actually help um, in the particular application. So we're excited about that. Um, and then we embark onto the machine learning part of this, the, the part that everyone cares the most about. It's really every, every aspect of designing these systems requires machine learning um, for the individual robot in order to just be able to do everything it needs to do because we can't predict everything ahead of time and do it right, but also so that it can continue to adapt to the user um, because the user changes over time as well. So it's a moving target. So the sort of the classical models of machine learning that present the user as a, if it's a fixed um, 
target so that you can come up with a policy and, and converge to it don't tend to apply for human behavior because people are a moving target, not just physically, but in terms of their behavior over time. And so, for example, in that context of mixed reality learning, we're looking at kinesthetic curiosity, the idea that we can learn what works for individual students over time by interacting with the human robot interaction where the student gets to move around and explore while they're learning something like coding, which is a major, of course, problem. We're trying to get more people to understand computing. Um, and so we're looking at really, um, Tom, this is work by Tom Greshel, very interesting results in terms of how we can, how the robot can encourage the student to be more curious. <coughs> Excuse me. If the student is more curious, then the student does more exploration and they learn more. Um, and this is interesting because it's not always the case. Students sometimes feel like they just need to get the right answer, which doesn't result them in learning as much. So there's some interesting uh, elements there. Another area that we worked on was uh, habit formation. So this is a really interesting challenge in general, which is if you want to change behavior, the best way to change your behavior is to form a habit. Right. You know, if you if you want to go for a walk every day, you should do it at the same time related to something else that you do, like right after breakfast. Um, so how do you form these habits? And the robot can be a cue and a reward for forming habits. And so we have done a study with um, we've done a study where we deployed a robot in the homes of elderly users for multiple weeks and had encour encouraged them basically to not sit too long. And the thing that was interesting about that, among other many, many things were interesting about it. But um, the interesting thing was how to motivate people to do this with the fact that they had the social partner, the robot in the home was inherently motivating. Um, but also, can you get them to start walking more and sitting less sort of on their own after you take the robot away? And what the robot was doing, it was using it was learning what kind of um, reward is most effective at getting people to stop um, sitting. So for some people it was jokes, for some people it was you know standing up and doing a little dance. Um, and what's interesting is we find that, first of all, it's not a novelty effect because this stays in the home for multiple weeks. So you know the robot tells jokes. You know they they really people seem to enjoy this even if the jokes are not that exciting and novel, right? It's the social presence of the robot, and it's not a novelty effect. Um, and we see high high engagement, high compliance. People do exactly what the robot is encouraging them to do and they start doing it on their own. But unfortunately, once you take the robot away, people just go back to their normal ways. So that tells us a couple of things. It tells us that this human machine interaction can be very, very effective in helping people to change their health habits. But it also shows what we already know about people, which is changing behavior is hard. And if you don't have some kind of support to help you do it, chances are you won't do it or you won't do it for long. Um, in terms of long-term personalization and long-term support, one of our longest studies was with the elderly um, Alzheimer's patients where we left the robot in the, in the nursing home for six months. And we looked at whether the robot can help people learn um, basically a song recognition behavior. And these were quite advanced Alzheimer's patients. And it was actually remarkably effective. Even though the patients had Alzheimer's, they learned the game. Uh, let me just show you what that looks like. <laughs> So basically what happens is the robot is singing, it's challenging them to say which, which button it is. Button. So the idea is that we want people to recognize the song and push the right button. And if we don't tell them what song it is, they have to remember it, they have to recognize it but we give them hints. By we, I mean the robot. And so the robot learns how many hints it needs to give, and it's more helpful for people who need more help, but it also changes the level of challenge. Um, and we also, the interesting study that was done here is we did a comparison with a screen. Uh, instead of having a physical robot, we just had a screen, and the elderly users would not look at the screen at all. So they just would not, they, it was like a TV to them and they didn't want to use it. So it was completely ineffective compared to the physical robot, which they thought in some cases was their grandchild. They liked having it visit, um, you know, overnight we had it in the closet, but they didn't know that. Um, so it never left. So it was really, it became a part of their lives. Um, and that was a very powerful result of our long-term study. This is work by Adriana Tapush from quite a while ago. Um, more recently, uh, following up on the infant work, we're looking at modeling dyads, so the interactions between the caregiver and the infant, 
to look at if the interaction is evolving as it should in terms of development. So infants learn during development uh, how where to look, how to um, how to take turns, how to hand off. And so that if, if that development is not on track, then it's usually a sign that something is going wrong. Um, and often it's a sign of maternal stress or the caregiver stress. And so we really can help potentially a lot of families by detecting these developmental delays early. Because with infants, the sooner the delays um, detected and intervened, the more likely it is that it could be in some cases entirely cured. So there's some really interesting work going on. And this is work, this is work by Lauren Klein. Um, and looking at sort of, as you look at the development of the, of the infant, um, what may or may not be typical for that particular infant, because there is no such thing as an average infant. I mean, you could create an average, but it doesn't tell you anything. What really matters is what's happening in that relationship with the caregiver. Um, are there other siblings around? What are the external factors? Um, so there's some really, really interesting opportunities here for machine learning as we look at multimodal data, right? So you're looking at multiple interactors, you're looking at eye gaze, you're looking at turn taking, you're li listening to the audio, um, just wonderful, wonderful areas of work. Um, and then our uh, recent major success story was a study with uh, families with children on the autism spectrum. And uh, these, uh, these families participated in a study that lasted a month or more. So we left the robot in their home for at least a month in order to get daily interactions with the robot to collect enough data to see if the robot was effective at helping the, the children learn, learn both cognitive and social skills, in particular, both math and social skills of eye gaze, turn taking, joint attention involving, um, involving their siblings or parents in the interaction. And this is a really, really complex problem from every perspective. It's hard to design robots that can be in the home safely and keep working. It's hard to understand users with any behavior, especially atypical behavior. It's hard to figure out how to do machine learning in a way that is personalized and adapts quickly enough. So you have the learning rate that adapts to such a wide spectrum of um, such giant variance in, in the sample. So just no, no shortage of wonderful challenges. I hope everybody will go and study this because it's so badly needed given the autism rates. Meet Adrian, age six. This is some great work. And his robot friend, Kiwi. You are doing an amazing job. On this weekend morning, they've settled in to play some games, along with big brother Darren. Adrian is on the autism spectrum, and Kiwi is no toy. It's a socially assistive robot. You are doing really great. Keep up the good work. So this video is uh, on the web, it's easy to find, um, but it, it's a really, if you watch the whole video, you can see uh, more details about who was involved and how this was developed. And it really was a major effort. Um, and we did a parallel study with our collaborators at Yale. They used a very different robot, um, but we had similar results in both cases in terms of outcomes for the children, which were very positive. Now, what we did next was we took those data um, from up to 20 children for a month at least. And we did and are still doing years of machine learning, trying to train models to do things like detect engagement, um, stimulate more um, social contact, more eye gaze, more joint attention, et cetera. And so just to give you some sense of the, of the work, uh, there's an element of, um, for example, Bayesian knowledge tracing is a type of work to do personalization for, <coughs> for the challenge level right, for math, this is already used in ITS. That part is not novel. What's more novel is looking at how to personalize both the challenge and the feedback. So think about it. If a child is trying very hard but not doing really well, you don't want to discourage them. If if challenge and uh, feedback, it's not just about performance. Um, because if you praise people too much, they get complacent. If you don't praise them enough, they give up. And this totally depends on personality as well. So there's some really interesting work there. Um, and we were looking at how much does it take to train this? And it takes quite a lot of training, even for an individual, right? Like, you know, 150 games played. So how many days does it take to play these games, which are like math games, to train up? And so this is a very interesting machine learning challenge, because on the one hand, you would like to have the person, you would like to have the system pre-trained 
And so 150 games is no big deal if you have a lot of uh, if you have a lot of data from other users. Unfortunately, the data from other users don't generalize to the to the individual user you're looking at. Um, and so that's what's really hard about ASD. Um, autism is defined by variance, um, and that makes learning very hard. So having more data is not does not necessarily mean better learning. And so what we found was that by combining and shuffling data and looking across participants, there's some peak level of data that can transfer. And in many cases, we're better off getting data for, from the individual over a period of a few days than using any data from other users, which is such a different result from typical machine learning. Um, so just wrapping up, especially since we had a, a bit of an interruption, just to wrap up. Um, so what, what we're really interested in, what a lot of our work is, unfortunately, it's a growing field, is this multimodal long-term personalization. So the idea is that the, the machine has the opportunity to interact with a user or multiple users through multiple modalities. There's vision, there's audio, um, there might be other modalities as well. Like for example, we might be able to get heart rate, we might be able to get uh, galvanic skin response, it depends. For example, we're going into uh, studying anxiety and that's where some of that might play a role. But it's very important to have all of this over time because every user is different and every user changes over time. Users change even during a session, much less over time. So in a given interaction session, right? At the beginning, they have the energy and the curiosity. Towards the end, they don't have either. But maybe towards the end, they're getting better at it. So they're you know, sort of encouraged in some sense. So there are all kinds of dynamics that are happening. And that human machine dynamic is really what needs to be studied. And there aren't great computational models for this yet. Um, so we need a lot more data sets, long-term, in-home, multimodal. We don't have that. Uh, we have the the field as a whole has um, a paucity of, of data sets that are actually meaningful. There are a lot of convenient data that don't tell us a whole lot, and there are not a lot of data from these complex, difficult environments. So I want to show you a video that really shows some beautiful work of, an, of a very young child, three-year-old, I believe, interacting with a robot in real time. So the robot is paying attention to what the child says, where the child looks, what the, what the state of the, the interaction is in the game and whether they're getting the answer right, and then gives praise and moves the game along only in response to the child doing all of the things, you know, eye gaze and, and uh, the game state and, and speaking. And so look at that in real time. From one to six. Count them out loud with me. One. One. Two, so the the movement, two, the looking, the the verbalization, three, the praise, three, and so on. There's a, an entire video of this. So that kind of interaction, why don't we see this in homes, in schools, in therapy centers? Why don't we have this today? Because it's hard, and no one gets why it's hard because they aren't working on it. So they need to start working on it. People are assuming that oh, you know, this will just happen when we put pieces of the system together. But in fact, that dynamic. The, the temporal interaction, the multimodal, the different time uh, time um, characterizations. So there's no no single simple way to in any way segment this. So this is just really a, a wonderful and, and complex problem and applies across many, many domains. And so we know that these kinds of systems uh, can really be empowering, empowering. We have seen wonderful outcomes for many, many research studies. Um, across groups across the world. So there's great potential. Um, but it's really only going to happen if people work on real problems in the real world, outside of the lab, with real data sets um, and not just convenient ones. And I also just want to link that to the larger global problems. That's true in more generally as well. So, you know, we have these larger societal problems and uh, they present real opportunities for research. Um, and so I just want to challenge everyone to choose to work on these meaningful real world problems as opposed to perhaps the more convenient or even more lucrative ones that are just, you know, this is your life's legacy. What do you want to work on? So I want to thank uh, my students above all and our collaborators and the supporters of our work, especially the National Science Foundation um, and uh, the audience for putting up with technical issues. And I will be happy to take questions now.
Uh, Claudio, you are mute. I cannot hear. Yeah. Sorry. Today is the day of the technical glitch. So <laughs> you're not alone, Maya. I did mine. Okay. Well, so. <laughs> so again, thank you for the, the wonderful talk. I think it was fascinating. It's fascinating to see robots having this kind of interaction, this sort of nuanced way of, of dealing with humans. I was really fascinated with the last video you have shown. And I'm sure some people in our audience who have children during the pandemics would love to have a, a robot that right now in, in their homes. And that sort of leads us to the fir first question that we always ask to the people in the seminar, to the presenters, which is, we're in this moment where we are hit by this pandemic. I mean, the pandemic, we, our life has all changed in many ways. Do you, how that has affected AI? Or do you think the, the for the AI research, well, I mean, what, is, what are the good and bad aspects of, of, of the pandemic, especially for our field? Uh, that's a really great question. And I would say that uh, certainly for those of us who are working on human machine interaction in general, it's been difficult to collect data during the pandemic. So that's been the major impediment, right? We, we especially in, in our work, we take pride in the fact that we get out into the nursing homes, into hospitals, into therapy centers, into homes. And that could not be done during the pandemic. Although therapy centers, hospitals, you know, they continued. So that's hopefully going to be over very soon with the vaccines, um, but that was a major impediment. Having said that, for those people who had meaningful data sets, once you collect a meaningful data set, you literally have years of work that you could do um, analyzing those data. And so, for example, the autism data set that I showed you that we collected in the homes over uh, more than a month, you know, I had a lot of students who were analyzing those data and developing models and publishing because they had put in that major investment. Um, but I think what's happening is most people don't, don't take the time or don't have the resources to put in the investment to collect real data. So they're stuck with whatever you can download off the web, which everyone else has already done 500 times. And there's not much interesting stuff to get out of it that would really help the real world. So that was a major pandemic. But I will say one thing, I really hope that this pandemic has had one positive effect on AI and intelligence systems, which is to turn these amazing minds, these young people who are so motivated to go into this field. Well, yes, get into this field, but do something meaningful for goodness sakes. Do something that's really gonna help the world with these problems, as opposed to, you know, all kinds of things that you can do for good money with AI. Mm, yeah. Well, I agree. Uh, Luciano Lugli, who was in the, in the audience, he posed this question, sort of long, let me tell you. Uh, he said, he says, uh, active learning has been proposed as a reliable approach in social robotics as an alternative to conventional machine learning. Uh, the end that this is a step that based machine learning on the assumptions of Piaget's genetic epistemology also as due as neuro social pragmatic practice. And then he questioned why is AI still sort of stubbornly, these are his words, crouching to real on real paradigms based on psychogenetic theories of human cognitive behavior development when they probably have something better in his view well, quite a long question <laughs> but um so i think people are kind of doing what they know this is typical right so for example i'll say that you know when i was in grad school i used reinforcement learning and people are still using reinforcement learning but is that wrong well i mean the brain uses reinforcement learning so it's not wrong um, the thing is though, we have a very hard time with these complex learning problems, which are not going to take one approach. So in general, in AI, there is kind of the fad of what is the popular approach and everyone uses it. And we're in the middle of a fad now and we have, because we have this very powerful tool that, and so everyone's trying to use the particular tool and it's not going to be any one tool. Um, and so that worries me more that people are getting sucked into one mindset. Um, that's why, for example, I love talking about, you know, when students come in and they say they want to do deep learning, I say, okay, tell me how you're going to do deep learning for autism. And if they give it some thought, they realized, oh, well, I, I don't really have a good answer for that. Oh, when there are more data, we'll be able to do it. No, that's not an answer. This is like when people used to say, when we have more computers, then we'll know everything. Guess what? We have more computers. 
And do we know everything? No. So mm -hmm. I agree that we need to be looking at more complex, probably more hybrid methods. And nobody knows how to do hybrid things principally. So people don't like it. They want to do one approach. And then what happens is people look under the, the light. It's like, oh, well, it's this, you know, for example, CNNs are good for a particular thing. So we use them for the thing that they're good at. And we're ignoring a lot of the other problems. Um, and so, yes, I've, I've been around the field long enough to where I'm feeling that pain as well. Um, but I think at least the more good tools we get, the more real problems we can start to address. And then that forces us to understand, oh, wait a minute, this is a harder problem. And so it's a good thing in the longer run. I'm an optimist. I think it's a good thing, but it's going to take a while because people feel like, you know, they have to publish so many papers every year, um, you yeah. know? And it's uh, if you're working on a really hard problem with real people, it's hard to wait, like, how many papers am I going to publish on tiny little things that are popular versus things that are actually hard and worth doing? Yeah. So I have a question from Pedro Americano, and he has, uh, says, most of the robots on the examples have a significant anthropomorphism. How does this affect the acceptance of the robot in groups, and to what extent? Would a biped robot be better than a wheeled, and in, in what conditions, in what settings? Yeah, that's a really great question. And in fact, it's such a great question that I'm thinking of, I've teamed up with a collaborator and we're going to write a, a paper on this design question because this is really, on, on one hand, you can say, well, there's a functional design aspect to it, right? Like, why does a robot need legs? It just maybe needs mobility. A lot of robots that we're working on now don't have mobility. And that's because we're really focused on this, you know, one-on-one -on -one motivational interaction. It doesn't need to move around. Moving around is additional cost and risk and danger and computation. And so if I don't need it, I don't have to focus on it. So that's a very pragmatic answer. Um, but then when you get to there, so there's the functional stuff, but then when it gets to interaction, it's not clear what those features are, right? So people always say, well, does it need to be humanoid? It doesn't, we've done a lot of work. As you saw, we have that owl-like robot. Um, and we even took the wings off of it. It had wings before. In our work with the elderly, the owl had wings. But in our work with children with autism, it doesn't. Why? Because the children were touching the wings too much. It, they found it too, you know, too interesting. And we don't want that because we want to teach them social skills. And in the real world, you don't go touching people, right? So in order to teach the right lesson, you need the right form for the robot. And that really varies. What are, If you're trying to teach about human social behavior, then, for example, you need a face that expresses similar features as the human face doesn't have to be a human face. It's even better if it's not human, because for many children, the human face is too much. But if it doesn't have a face, how are you going to teach about um, human facial expressions? That's why, for example, the NOW robot, the Aldebaran NOW, which is used a lot for autism work, that's a main limitation it has. It doesn't have a face where you could teach about facial expressions. And human facial expressions are a major source of information for interaction, right? So mm -hmm. it really depends on the function and on the social context. Um, it's a non-trivial problem, definitely. And we're stuck with the the platforms that we have, right? I okay. always say this, you can't go to a store and buy the robot that you want. It's not like there are 50 of them. I'm like, okay, for this study, I'm gonna get 10 of these. No, you're stuck with what you have and it's never quite right because it's never designed exactly for what you want. Um, so we're still very early in robotics for that. I, I can't wait till we get to a point where you can really design what you need to the best of your abilities with working with the community, the users, and then actually use that for your study. Oh, that'll be the day. But is that different for infants, the, the, the issue of anthropomorphism? Well, it is in particular for infants because, well, it's really true across ages, but especially for infants, their perception is so um, poor, really, if you think about it. We have a very uh, low understanding of, of how human vision and perception develops over time. So young children, you know, they don't like get bored understanding the world. Vision comes in, but they don't know how to interpret it. But they are hardwired for certain things, like at some point faces, right? And so it's really important. And then you've got mirror neurons, right? So if you present them with stimuli that are appropriate for their developmental stage, they will be able to interpret them because they'll map to something developmental. But if you present them with like, Oh, I don't know if you present them with the pepper humanoid full body robot only to the extent that it maybe maps to something adult like maybe it'll work 
But this is why the, the baby-sized humanoid is actually a very interesting embodiment to study because it, it relates to them in size and in the kinematics. Um, but of course, we don't actually put the babies in the imager to figure out what's going on in their brains. I mean, I don't want to do that to babies, but that would be the way to tell. Mm -hmm. So Fernando Osorio, who is who's helping us backstage, by the way, uh, he has... Uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> as the robots are not conscious, what do you think about problems that can arise from bad behavior induced by humans like, and he cites the movie, Robo and Frank, he saw an image in your talk. Best movie, best movie. I love that movie. I think everybody in robotics and AI should see that movie and not a lot of other really bad robot movies out there. I mean, I would say the two best robotics movies are Robot and Frank and WALL-E. Everything else, mm -hmm. eh. All right, so first we got that out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, that is a really good problem. Um, I, you know, I like to say that robots are, you know, only as bad as the the designers and the motivations of the designers, right? And so, you know, people tend to worry about like, what if the robot goes bad and wants to kill me? Why would the robot want to kill you? It gets nothing out of that, right? It's more like, you know, what does the person design them to do? Um, so the reason that Robot and Frank is that a really good movie, actually, I had nothing to do with it. I was really happy to see when it was when they when it came out. It was like, wow, this is just right. It's because the motivation for the robot to do everything it does is based on, like it says, oh, I'll only stay alive if you exercise. So now the robot has a motivation and the human have a, the motivation and those motivations are aligned. And that's a good thing. Um, that's the, the right way to design them. Or at least that's what the robot says. But then, you know, later we'll see what happens. Um, so I don't worry about killer robots that way. What I do worry about um, is that, you know, whoever designs and sells the robots has a particular motivation, right? So they could be like selling you products. It could be like, hey, I have your working robot uh, that helps you go for a walk. And by the way, why don't you put on your Nike shoes and, and your Adidas uh, jacket and your, right? So now you're, you're manipulating the perception from a consumer bias, let's say, but it could be any bias. Um, but we're already subject to that. The robot is not special. Your phone does this all the time. Your search engine does this all the time. So one of the things that I always love to bring up because it, I always get asked about privacy. I always get asked, oh my gosh, what about these robots and privacy? And I just wanna say, you realize your phone has a camera and it's looking at you all the time and it's always on and it's listening to you all the time. And so what's how's the robot different except it has a different form. But like, you're not going to actually take the robot with you everywhere, but you take your phone everywhere. You take it to the bathroom and it's listening the whole time. And so just think about the privacy choices that you're already making. Um, that's not to dismiss the robotic side of things, but I think people need to think about privacy way earlier than they start to worry about it with a particular embodiment of a physical robot. I know that's not what you asked, but I wanted to throw it in. Okay. Now, you're just giving me a, a really scary view of what a Facebook robot would feel like. But anyway, let's... <laughs> That's good. I think it's good to be worried because um, as people, we have, you know, it, it's, we, it's sort of, there is a cost-benefit analysis, right? And we give up privacy in return for something, right? So, mm -hmm. like, I like my iPhone for all the features, and increasingly, you know, I've had to compromise privacy. Like now the camera is always on. I can't turn it off, right? So I had to compromise that because I'm still making a choice that I like that product. But it's not really what I want. So that, but that's what's happening always. So you have to really think about it. Like how, what is the way to manage that? You know, what is it? Is it through competition? What is it through? Because that's already happening. We are so down that road already. So we have a... Uh... If you can stay with us a couple more minutes. Yeah, I love uh, it. I'm sorry for the interruption. No, no, no problem. That that I mean, we are. It, I mean, all this has helped us to co to make uh, co uh, connection easier, making it easier to to have access to to incredible people like you. But it has a price, and the price is the <laughs> <laughs> is going through the. The mysterious channels uh, right. of, of communications of the world. So if other who is asking, is, could you tell us a bit about the, the language generation model for the robots and maybe a little more about language in general and the use of language in your work? 
Absolutely. Yeah, I, I skimmed over a lot of things. And um, I will say that if you folks are interested in any of this stuff, you know, if you, you know, the Google Scholar, my webpage, we have a lot of publications. You, if you just search by keyword, you'll find out more. But um, to address that particular question. So um, the wonderful challenge about talking robots or talking computers in general is that, you know, when an agent talks, people assume immediately that it understands. And so if I, if my robot says things like, hi, uh, my name is Ki Kiwi, uh, people immediately assume that they could say, oh, hey, I'm Maya. And they think that the robot can understand. So there's this really careful thing you have to do about what the expectations we are raising. And that's a fundamental, that's like the whole Uncanny Valley thing, right? Because Uncanny Valley is not about believable appearance. It's about believable everything. Um, and so we tend to use, we actually, we don't do natural language understanding and natural language processing. We don't do speech. So we use off the shelf systems, right? Um, like, you know, AWS, whatever, anything like that. So we don't, other people are so much better at that, right? And it's getting better every day. It used to be, you know, when I started in this field, there were very few models of children's speech. Now, because of all the various devices in people's homes, children's speech is becoming uh, much more understandable for better or worse it is and so so we just use that now the next the, the really the interesting thing for us is it's really dialogue right so now how do you understand enough about what the person is saying so that you can respond appropriately and drive any like sort of support their behavior that they need to do and it's still a tricky question because if you do keyword understanding you can really go wrong right mm -hmm. like you know, somebody can use a keyword about their family and they could say something that's really, you know, like, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know, like my brother's very sick, but you could catch brother and not sick and you start talking about the brother, it could be very inappropriate. So that's still tricky, although it's getting better every single day. So when we design these dialogues, we tend to really, well, we tend to do a couple of things. One is that we, we just stay on a rail about, you know, anything the robot is talking about is relative to the task, right? So it's like, hey, but have you gone for a walk? You wanna hear a joke about walking? Okay, and then we also disclose the robots, the limits of its knowledge and vulnerability. And this is a really big deal. So pretending that the robot understands everything is a giant uh, pitfall. So often our robots will say things like, you know, I won't always understand things correctly. I hope that's okay. Tell me if I'm wrong, right? So disclosing the limits of the robot's knowledge. That's, it's really important and it's pretty rare in technology today. Everyone is trying to pretend that it's better than it is. And then you have these sometimes catastrophic failures and lack of loss of trust. And so we, we tend the other way. The robot is like, we used to have this joke um, that the robot would say, I'm not as smart as I look. Um, and it's really, it's important, right? Because we used to have a, in the early days when we were working with stroke patients, we had a robot, like the humanoid you saw, the mouth would get stuck. So the robot would talk, but the mouth wouldn't move, which is easy for robots, but not easy for people. So he would say something like, oh, I'm sorry, my my mouth is not working today. Uh, you can, and, and the interesting thing was that people immediately became very understanding and accepting. They would say things like, oh, I understand. Sometimes my hip doesn't work, you know? And then they would make some joke some disclosure, and then they would be very forgiving. And then the robot could be much less perfect going forward. And that's a big lesson. So that's a lesson mm -hmm. that it's the humanizing, in a sense, of the interaction. So that's how we manage the fact that it'll never be perfect. Uh, in the meantime, I'm very happy that people who are working on NLU and NLP and training ever better models, absolutely. Now, the last thing to add, we work with a lot of special populations. So our our systems are not necessarily as able to, to make use of the standard models. Imagine if you're working with an elderly person, um, their speech is not going to be very readily recognizable with your standard models. Uh, somebody with a speech impediment, um, a child that has a lot of um, emotional range in their speech. All of those things are very hard. So we end up a lot of times having to train our own models on everything which I think is, it's, a, it's hard, but it's healthy. So my students are, my students are amazing. They're just, oh, love them. So uh, I just want to do a little segue on this because I was, you, you mentioned issues of gender. I wonder if you have seen issues of race and race perception in, in this kind of work. I mean, there's a lot of talk. In fact, I'm right now, even myself, I'm doing some work related to racing language, but have you seen, 
people perceiving so, robots in, in racial yeah, terms? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question. We haven't done we haven't done those studies, and so I can't say anything from a study perspective, but what I see for sure is that, think about it, like look at the majority of robots that have been made and put on the market. They're mostly white. I mean, like really white, because white is high tech, and it's, you know, it somehow conveys things being clean and pristine and new and smart. So I'm not saying, I'm not comparing that to black, but what I'm saying is even in the design of machines, there's this general look like people sometimes refer to it as being Apple-like. And I've talked to any number of people who are like, why are you doing these machines that look like animals? You know, they should look more high tech. And I, I think that's absolutely wrong. They should look the way that the user finds most enjoyable. Like these Apple-like robots being built for, for elderly people, I think it's completely wrong. I know lots of elderly people and no one's interested in, in some beautiful, sleek, white, shiny thing. So I think it goes well beyond race. I think it goes to the, always the biases of people who are making these things. So in the lab, you have the bias of young people who come from a particular, so there's a gender bias, there's, a, there's an age bias, they don't really understand anything about the elderly. And then in industry, um, in industry it's even worse because in industry you might get wonderful people, but they're silenced because there's this sense of what the competition is. And it's like, oh, well, you know, here is a design firm that's really famous. So we should do what they say. Who cares what they say? What matters is the users. Um, but I think currently we're not, we're not there yet. Although I predict, I'm predicting. So, you know, user experience, UX is a field. I think that's really going to grow when it comes to robotics. It's going to be a major, major, quite technical field that brings together design and equity and function and efficacy. That's really hard. And you can't just outsource it to social scientists. You cannot give it to engineers and you can't slap in ethics like at the, uh, at the end, like, oh, is it okay? Do you think let's ask seven people who don't look like us, right? So I think that is a really, really complex new field um, that's going to emerge and, and it's exciting. I always love it when new interdisciplinary things emerge because it's not happening by just stapling three different backgrounds together and hoping it works. So I think to finish, I'd like to, one more question, if you could tell us a little more about your work on promoting STEM for kids and especially for, for girls. I think it's a wonderful kind of work the right month to talk about, right? So exactly. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking that. Um, so obviously in our research, right, in my lab's research, we've done a lot of things uh, for technologies for children, not exclusively for children, as you see, but the beauty of working for with technology for children is uh, if you help someone who is young early, it can make a huge difference in their life. It's like a vector. You, you move it a little bit when they're young and it, it makes a huge difference later on. Um, so that's just really rewarding. But also for me specifically, you know, I was uh, an immigrant girl in a field that was male dominated. And so, you know, I've had a lot of experiences. Now I'm a mom of multiple girls and a boy. And, you know, everyone has their challenges and their struggles. And it, what I see is just so many people, not just girls, uh, so many people not pursuing STEM because of early experiences that are just wrong headed. The stupidest thing people say out of meaning well. It's like, oh, you know, let's buy everything pink for girls and let's not give them the right kind of toys. And so you don't get exposure. So how would they know what they're even interested in and that, and that how would they ever know they can be good at it? So that early gender typing is really dangerous. And I try to offset that. I, I tell girls all the time, you don't have to love math. Um, that's such a, people just think that you have to love math to be an engineer. It's not true. It's not true. Not everything in engineering is about math. You have to take some math to get through college. Fine. Who cares? Right? It's like flossing. You just have to do it. It doesn't mean that you love it. I don't love it, but you just do it because the goal is something bigger. Um, and so that's, that's, but it's, it's the same across race. I live in Los Angeles, our university is surrounded by a low income yeah. area where we have a lot of Hispanic and African-American kids and they don't, they're never told that they could be good at computing. Um, and so of course they don't consider it uh, because of the digital divide. And that's horrible because who's gonna tell us about robot design that is race sensitive if they never get 
to learn the stuff and actually get to be the designers. And so I think that stuff is incredibly important. I mean, I love the I love the research we do, but sometimes I think the outreach is almost more important and more powerful because the more good people I can get in the field, that's gonna do like those are the people that are gonna make all the difference. So I find really great enjoyment in that. Um, there's so many wonderful young people out there that we should motivate to get out here and do things better than we're doing them. Okay, oh, wonderful. So if people want to learn more about your work in STEM, they can go to the, to, is that in your website, I believe, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big believer in putting stuff on the web and making it publicly available. I even have a little mentoring page that used to be about gender, but now it's for everything. You know, it's like little things like, I hear young people saying things like, I just don't know how to get started. And, you know, I tell them, here are all these free things you can learn. And then like, you can go into some neighborhood and just help a, a business make a website, but a, a business that's doing something important, like that, that's helping people, like a nonprofit, right? And so, I, I, you know, I try to put resources on the web and I try to point people to, there's so many things that are available to help people do something meaningful, but because there's so much, people don't know where to find it. But in fact, there's quite a lot. So I keep trying to put stuff up there to maybe help those who are interested. Okay. So, uh, so I'd like to end by, by thanking you, uh, thanking you for all this, this wonderful work you're doing. Thank you for being with us. This I also like to thank the almost 100 people who are watching us. We are we are going to be here. We are going to, going to do other talks here. Please uh, go to our um, LinkedIn page or Facebook page. Learn more about our, what the, the events that are coming. Uh, also, this talk and the previous talks are all available from our YouTube channel. Okay. And uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone. And I hope to see you again in, uh, next month uh, with the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you.